Hi, everyone. We're so happy that you're here. Welcome to the, tra the um, TAPI training today, 10 things school nurses and health office staff need to know about why we immunize. We appreciate your time today, especially at the end of the school day. Um, thank you for spending time with us to learn more about vaccines and also the IDR. We are thrilled to see so many of you join us. We have a lot of school nurses and health office staff here with us today representing all counties in Arizona. So that is very exciting for me to hear. Um, I would like to give a special shout out to my kids school district, Gilbert Public Schools. I saw several of you registered. So thank you for all you do, especially all you do at my kids schools. Um, school nurses are great and health office staff, you guys really keep things moving along, keeping everything, everyone safe and healthy. So we appreciate you and appreciate your time. Um, thank you to TAPI and um, Central Arizona Area Health Education Center. They are the ones who are co-sponsoring this to offer you CEUs if those are applicable to you. Um, just a few reminders, if you could keep your microphone or phone on mute unless you are speaking, um, please use the Zoom chat box to ask any questions. We have a lot of um, great resources to share with you today, and we want to make sure that we answer your questions also. Um, if you have any, any difficulties, message the administrator. And then all handouts and videos will be available to you after the training, including a recording of today's training. So if um, you reference something and you think, oh, that'd be helpful. We definitely will give you all of those resources um, today. Just a disclosure that presenters have no financial interest or relationship with the commercial supporters of this educational activities. Um, that is, we need to say that to offer you CEUs today. Okay, so the training today, 10 things school nurses and health office staff need to know about why we immunize. Um, we have some great presenters today. Uh, my name is Laura Smith. I'm with TAPI and I'm a program manager of community education. Um, also with us is Kimberly Ivich, who is a public health nurse from Maricopa County Department of um, Public Health. She has a um, someone cannot hear me. Can everyone not hear me? I sure hope so. I can hear you fine. Okay. I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Um, so Kimberly, she has a lot of great insights to share and she's a great contact at Maricopa County and she's also a former school nurse. So we are really happy that she is here. Um, Blake Mayhack from ADHS, Arizona Department of Health Services is here. He is the expert in IDRs. So if you have any really technical questions or some error message you keep getting, please put those questions in the chat. He is here monitoring the chat and is happy to answer all of those technical questions. And then we also have my chappy colleague, Denise Olson in the chat. She is the vaccine expert. So if you have any vaccine related questions, put those in the chat too, and you'll see a response from Denise. Okay, thank you all for joining us. Um, so the training objectives are to discuss 10 science-centered evidence-based con concepts about vaccines, um, teach you how to answer common questions and maybe address miscon misconceptions that people may have, parents may have when you're talking to them. And we want to make sure that you know where to go for vaccine information, um, trusted, reliable online sources um, that you can either distribute to parents if they are requesting that or just for your own education. Um, our goal today is that you feel a little more um, comfortable talking about vaccines and the process of how they're made and um, but why vaccines are important and how they benefit our communities and schools. We will have some quizzes throughout the presentation, so make sure to put those answers in the chat box, and we hope that you win some prizes because we love to give out prizes. Okay. I want to show this quick video about some things we have learned through vaccination. Um, it's a pretty important one, so Let's 
Let me know if um, you can't hear it. I think everything's set to go. I want to tell you about a time, time in American history so that It never repeats so itself. So it never repeats itself. It was a harrowing time. A heart-wrenching time. I could hear my mother warn me. Seal, don't go out and play. My family was ravaged. Thousands and thousands died. I was scared. So scared. And then one day. And then one day. And then one day, there was hope. Before vaccines, there were few ways to help protect against deadly illnesses. Diseases like measles, meningitis, diphtheria, hib, whooping cough, or polio, which killed my grandma's youngest son. Without vaccines, these threats can reemerge. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here to tell my children to help protect their children. Get your kids vaccinated and keep them on schedule. I never want my grandchildren to see what I saw. The real dilemma that we have to face is that because vaccines have been so effective over the past 50 to 75 years, people have forgotten about the diseases that those vaccines prevent. We don't usually see people with polio walking around or see people with measles or mumps. Um, and it's easy to forget about the diseases that those vaccines were developed to fight. This phenomenon is called vaccine and vaccine amnesia or public health amnesia, where a public health initiative such as vaccines have become so successful that people people forget how bad it once was. And then we can see things like measles, measles cases start to pop up more and more often across the country. This map shows exactly what we're talking about, that public health amnesia. Um, kids are at risk for disease. Measles was thought to be eradicated in, two, in the year 2000, but in 2014, new cases started to pop up in unvaccinated communities. And on the map here, we see that five years after that, we see that um, in 2019, all the states in dark blue, which we see Arizona is highlighted there, they reported at least one case of measles. So if you look and count, there are 28 states that experienced at least one measles case. And the rates for measles has even increased since 2019. Um, that is more than half of the states reporting a disease that we believed to have been eradicated. So the problem persi persists and those outbreaks are a direct effect of lower rates of immunization. And even though, we haven't seen a case of measles in 14 years. Once those pop back up, um, the disease hasn't really gone away yet. We continued immunization is the only way to prevent these long, um, these diseases long term. And then also to note, pertussis or whooping cough is also beginning to recirculate. <clears throat> Arizona kids are especially at risk. ADHS requires every school to report once a year on the coverage levels of kids enrolled in schools, also known as the immunization data report. This information is made available to the public and parents can be informed about coverage levels. Our schools in Arizona used to be at the 95% coverage rate, but over the last five to 10 years, the level of protection has begun to drop as the number of vaccine exemptions have begun to increase. So some schools are reporting 30 to 40% coverage. Because of that, Arizona has been identified as a hotspot um, because of low, um, uh, low coverage levels. The data shows that the diseases still exist and are circulating. However, I could argue that if you've never experienced these diseases, you can fall into the trap of believing that they no longer exist or will probably never touch you personally. I have a really important video I want to show you. Um, it can be hard to watch, but I'm going to play the whole thing just so you can kind of experience what we're trying to fight against when we do vaccinate. Okay. 
Okay, take a bath here, honey. Come on. Almost there. There we go. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. That's about all I can stomach today. <laughs> the video is so sad. Uh, this baby has pertussis or whooping cough. Um, and it's really important that the people around her get vaccinated to prevent her from having that. Uh, number three reason why we vaccinate. Outbreaks are preventable when parents make the decision to vaccinate. So when we talk about, um, when we immunize 95% of a population against a vaccine preventable disease, that's how we prevent the outbreak from happening. Uh, if 95% of people have immunity, the disease cannot spread through the community. It's also important that our youngest kids are immunized before entering school to protect the community around them. It's often referred to as herd immunity or community immunity. We are attempting to keep our communities healthy, and the best way to do that is to vaccinate. So just an example of that, it's easiest to think about community immunity in terms of a fence. So those of us with immunizations are kind of the planks of a fence. And together, if enough of us are immunized, surrounding one person who is not immunized, whether that um, be because they're too young or medically cannot be immunized, those people are protected by all of those around them. Um, when a disease comes up, it will hit the fence and those immunized people will not get sick or be able to spread that disease. And that protects the under immunized, unimmunized. Um, outbreaks happen when there are too many holes in the fence and then the disease just floats right through. Once it infects an unimmunized person, it puts all the other unimmunized people at risk. Number four, we know that vaccines work. Vaccines are studied and followed to see how well they're working and continually tested and updated as needed to work even better. Um, it's a great chart here to look on the left here. Um, and it shows when we eradicated certain diseases and how much they decreased. So we see smallpox was eradicated in 1980, it decreased 100%, it's amazing. Um, pertussis has decreased 94.9% after vaccine was available. Uh, polio, we mentioned that earlier, that was eliminated in 1979, decreased 100%. So it's a great chart to look at and study. And also this is available on our website if you'd like to know more about that. Vaccines save an estimated 42,000 lives every year in the U.S. alone, which is three times more than seatbelts and child restraints combined. So think about that for a minute. Choosing not to vaccinate your child is like putting them in a car with no seatbelt or child restraint. Uh, most of the time, it would probably, probably be fine because statistically, how often do you get into a car accident? 
Maybe you're only driving to and from the school, um, but it only takes a single incident for that seatbelt or child restraint to be worthwhile in saving your child's life. It only takes a single exposure to a disease that you can't even see for your child to become ill with one of these diseases. And the long-term effects on their health can be very serious. Um, that is if they survive. Number five, vaccine offers protection to us, sometimes in different ways. Newborns receive some immunity from their mother, but it wears off when they're still too young. And there are some people that cannot get vaccinated because they're too sick or have allergies. Uh, vaccinating you and your family protects those people and yourself. Um, getting shots offers protection that will help your child's immune system fight even when they're exposed to those diseases. Um, like I said, the newborns get the protection from their mother, but that begins to wear off when they're around two months of age. And this is why there's a schedule that starts when the baby's two months old to continue the protection throughout their life. Let me see here. We've got Denise in the chat. Thank you so much. That is awesome. <clears throat> Number six reason why we vaccinate, vaccine antibodies act as personal ninjas to protect from the actual disease. So after someone gets in the actual disease, it can take several months to years for their immune system to fully recover, which leaves them vulnerable for other illnesses and diseases. So it's really better to just get the vaccine in the first place. The vaccine tells your body that it, what that it needs to equip itself against the disease if, before you are ever exposed, and your body in response creates a bunch of antibodies that are like ninjas just waiting to fight off the exposure. Many years ago when the vaccines were developed, they had a lot more antigens in them to protect against, against the disease. So I am in my 40s and 30 years ago, my um, vaccines, protected, they took 30, uh, 3,000 antigens to protect, protect against eight diseases. Today, my children, um, the vaccines that they got use 305 antigens to protect against 14 diseases. So that's amazing. Um, that is like we were talking about before, vaccines are continually tested and improved and um, refined and updated to reduce the amount of antigens needed to protect against the disease. Okay, our first trivia question. Um, make sure you put the answer in the chat and Denise will reach out to you um, if you are a winner. So trivia question, what vaccine is recommended during pregnancy? You may or may not know this, so this could be a good one. Uh, pertussis is A or the Tdap. B, flu, C, COVID, D, B, and C, or E, all of the above. Look at all these answers coming in. I love to see it. Give you another few seconds to type it in if you'd like. Can you tell us the choices again, please? Sure. So question, what vaccine is recommended during pregnancy? A, pertussis or Tdap. Uh, B is flu vaccine. C, COVID vaccine. Um, answer option D is B and C, which is flu and COVID, or E, all of the above. Okay, thank you all for answering. This is great. The answer is E, all of the above. Um, it is recommended that you get your pertussis, flu, and COVID vaccines during pregnancy to protect you and your baby. Okay, reason number seven why we vaccinate. Um, vaccines given in pregnancy protect babies. There are new recommendations focused on pregnant mothers that during every pregnancy, the mother get a flu, pertussis, and COVID vaccine to protect her and her baby. 
it's important that you talk to your OBGYN or have um, the parent talk to the OBGYN about when and where to get these important vaccines. Many people have all members of the household get these vaccines to increase the protection for the newborn um, because these vaccines given in pregnancy are the baby's only line of defense until they can start getting vaccinated at two months. And we'll talk more about COVID vaccines. You may have a lot of questions um, and we always get a lot of questions when we do this training. So we have some slides um, dedicated specifically to COVID. Um, I was pregnant in 2020 and um, she's almost two now, but I have school-aged kids and we all got our flu shots that year. And what, you know, the kids are, we get our flu shots every year, but I just reminded my kids that we're getting these flu shots to protect our new baby coming because she could not get a flu shot. Um, so it's really important to kind of protect those around the baby um, by being immunized and protect the baby by being immunized with those around them. Also good for grandparents and aunts, whoever wants to cuddle that and snuggle that baby. Uh, here's a reminder that the best defense against the flu is the flu shot. It is flu season. Flu shots are widely available. So we do encourage you to get the flu shot. All of those, um, all those protections that we talked about, you know, the picket fence, it really helps protect those around us in the community that are not able to get a flu shot and help stop the spread also. Uh, let me see, next one. Okay, another trivia question. Feel free to put your answer in the chat. Uh, question, can someone get a flu vaccine and a COVID vaccine in the same visit? A is yes, B is no, and C is not sure. Lots of answers. This is great. Okay. Um, the answer, can someone get a flu shot, a flu vaccine and COVID vaccine at the same time? The answer is yes, you can. Um, it is very simple to get them done at the same time. I did that this year. I got my COVID booster and flu shot at the same time. And um, it's great. I didn't have to go back again later um, to get another vaccine. So yes, you can. Number eight, doctors and science support vaccination. So here's a list of people, um, of organizations that support vaccines. The American Academy of Pediatrics, Academy of Family Physicians, um, all of these strongly support protecting children with recommended vaccinations. Um, make sure that you can, you feel like you can trust your healthcare provider. Their education, knowledge, and experience is what you can rely on if you have questions. And they're a great place to send parents if you get stuck on a question um, they have about vaccines that you're not quite sure how to answer. Refer them back to their um, healthcare provider. Okay, now we get to the school part. <laughs> and you all are very familiar with um, off to school, up to date on shots. So vaccines are required when ch children enter childcare, preschool, and kindergarten to protect them and their classmates. Um, it's really important for these kids to be up to date on their shots because when they enter the classroom, they are in very close contact with many other children where diseases can spread rapidly. You don't want a sick student to um, go home and bring home a preventable disease and then expose to that to a younger sibling or older adult that is perhaps um, under immunized. Each state has their own requirements in terms of school entry and vaccines. So I'm sure you all are familiar with the Arizona state requirements for vaccines prior to coming to school. And if you're unsure, um, we you can refer to ADHS's website or the CDC has a, a link to the um, 
website also. You can kind of look it up by state. <clears throat> And number 10, the kids still need protection as they grow. So following CDC recommended immunization schedule will help protect the child as they go through childcare, preschool, elementary school, middle school, high school, and college. We talk a lot about baby shots, but the same recommendations for vaccines continue throughout their life. We recommend following the CDC schedule for immunizations. Those are constantly updated with new and improved vaccines as they come out. You can go to the CDC website to review the recommendations and they even have a printable vaccine schedule that's easy to read. Um, on our TAPI website, we also have uh, the vaccine schedules, which can be really helpful if you want to post it in your office or um, have a bunch printed to hand out to parents if they have any questions about which vaccine is, you know, is my fifth grader need. Um, it's a helpful tool to refer to. So Denise can put the link to our website in the chat. And Blake is also awesome. Thank you. Okay, this is a great video that talks about why vaccines work. It's a little bit long, about seven minutes, but it's a really great foundation for understanding why vaccines work. Um, if you have any questions, just kind of think about them and put them in the chat and we can go through um, any common questions that you may have. Orange, you glad you don't have scurvy? In 1747, in the first medical trial ever performed, Scottish physician James Lind found out that eating citrus fruits could cure scurvy. Now, today we know this works because citrus contains high levels of vitamin C. In fact, ascorbic acid, a common name for vitamin C, comes from the Latin for not scurvy. By issuing rations of lemon juice to sailors, the British Navy was able to pretty much eliminate the disease until the late 1800s, when polar explorers suddenly began to see scurvy again. The copper pots holding their lime juice had destroyed the vitamin C, but they were pretty confused. So despite James Lynn's experiments 150 years before, citrus fruits became the enemy. And when Robert Falcon Scott set out to reach the South Pole in 1911, he carried the finest in canned meat products, biscuits, chocolate, tea, and zero vitamin C. A Norwegian team beat them to the pole by five weeks, and during their sad journey home, Scott and his team perished in a blizzard, sick and weak from what was probably scurvy. It had been so long since anyone had seen this disease, the British had forgotten how to prevent it. When we create such effective solutions, we can forget how serious the problems were. Thankfully, people today don't die of scurvy or polio. Since the introduction of Jonas Salk's polio vaccine in 1955, the disease has been nearly eradicated from the earth. The thing to remember is that this is a continuous process. Compare the 358 infections reported in 2014 to the 1940s, when half a million people per year were paralyzed or died from polio infections. Vaccines work. Our immune system is on constant alert against germy baddies with millions of white blood cells, each on the lookout for specific infections. When an immune cell meets its target, it replicates itself and this clone army sends a barrage of protein weapons called antibodies to label the trash for cleanup. And after the infection is gone, so-called memory cells stick around, ready to mount a fast attack in case this germ shows up again. This is how we develop immunity and it works pretty well, you know, since we're all still alive. But even with all that, some super bad germs can take us out before our immune centuries have had time to call up their clone army. This is especially true for young children. Their immune systems are fresh out of basic training. Thankfully, we have vaccines, which are made of tiny pieces or weakened versions of viruses or bacteria. They let our immune system see what the bad guys look like and recruit those all-important memory cells before we ever have to actually see the real enemy. Thanks to vaccines, the U.S. was able to eliminate measles in the year 2000. But in recent years, as more and more parents are refusing to vaccinate their children or are vaccinating them later than what doctors recommend, it's back. In most states, more than 90% of children are vaccinated, but that's not enough to keep a disease like measles at bay. 
In our episode about Ebola, we talked about a number called R0, the basic reproduction number for a disease, or the number of people infected by one person in a susceptible population. For Ebola, that number is low, but for measles, each sick person will infect up to 18 others. But luckily, vaccines can change that. The fraction of people who are vaccinated or immune can lower the reproduction number below one, which means the disease is disappearing. 90% of unprotected people who come in contact with somebody who has measles, even just breathing the same air, will become infected. To control a super contagious virus like that, the vaccination rate has to be 95% or above. And right now the US is lagging behind and measles is making a comeback. The Guardian put together a simulation of just how this so-called herd immunity works. When enough of a population is vaccinated, even if it's not 100%, the herd can protect the unprotected. With vaccine refusal on the rise, our herd immunity is breaking down. Preventable diseases like measles and whooping cough have become our scurvy. Most of us don't know anyone with polio, and I mean, measles, it's not that bad, right? Well, yes, it is that bad. Before the age of vaccines, millions of people were killed by diseases that today are just bad memories. Vaccines have let us develop a sort of generational amnesia. Today we expect our children to grow up healthy and we're lucky that we don't appreciate just how dangerous these diseases are. Like science writer Seth Mnookin says, vaccines are victims of their own success. Because of stories like Andrew Wakefield's discredited study wrongly linking vaccines and autism and the news media's obsession with pictures of crying terrified children being poked with needles, People are nervous about vaccines. This anxiety isn't new, though. When Edward Jenner in 1798 saw that milkmaids didn't catch smallpox, well, he realized that because they'd been exposed to the similar cowpox disease, they were immune. And based on this, he developed an early smallpox vaccine by inoculating humans with the cow virus. In fact, the word vaccine itself has bovine origins. Still, as as far back as 1802, critics were claiming that the smallpox inoculation would turn you into a cow. Vaccines don't come without risk. Nothing does. But on average, fewer than one in a million people will experience a dangerous reaction to common vaccines. And car accidents, playing outside, even walking will injure more children. Vaccines are asking us to do something altruistic, to make a choice to protect not only ourselves and our children, but also those around us. Author Eula Biss says that vaccines are one of the most empathetic things that we can do. A system that's based on people voluntarily using their bodies to protect other vulnerable people. And that's something I hope we don't forget. Now, I'm a doctor, but I'm not that kind of doctor. It's natural to have questions about vaccines and you should have a conversation with your medical professional. They want the best for you and yours. I will give you one prescription though, and that's to subscribe so you can get a full dose of science every week. And if you wanna read some amazing books about vaccines, check out Seth Mnookin's The Panic Virus and On Immunity by Eula Biss. Links in the description. Stay curious. Today we know that citrus fruits curse scurvy, Okay. Um, I hope you all learned something from that video. Um, and if you have any like specific vaccine questions, please feel free to put those in the chat. We'd be happy to answer them. Uh, Blake made a really important point. He said it's important to know on those numbers that that is happening in one year. And think of the COVID toll with a much larger population. So it is very interesting to um, live during a pandemic. It's been very interesting. Okay, let's see. Next. Because they there we go. Okay, so let's talk about COVID vaccines. Um, everything we learned today about how vaccines work apply to the new COVID vaccines, including all the safety monitoring and approvals. Full safety trials were done on each vaccine and ongoing monitoring continues. Children were not the first to get the vaccine because clinical trials did not include the children at first. So, however, as the vaccine was proven to be safe in adults, additional trials included children, and now children ages six months and older can receive the COVID vaccine. Um, 
Next, COVID vaccine for kids. Um, the child may need other vaccines like Tdap, um, meningococcal, HPV. It's really safe for them to get them at the same time as their COVID vaccine. Just a reminder that vaccinated kids protect other kids in the classroom, as well as teachers and administrators, and also their friends and family. And COVID vaccines will get the kids back to activities and friends that they love. Um, a lot of families had to not participate in a lot of activities during the height of the pandemic before um, COVID vaccines were available because they could not risk getting sick. So um, now with the vaccine being available, families are a lot more free to get their kids back to all of those um, activities and friends and family that they love. Okay, um, so younger kids, younger children may experience fewer vaccine side effects than adolescents or young adults. Um, children with evidence of prior infection may have fewer side effects than those without evidence of prior infection. And um, when you get a COVID vaccine, expected side effects um, include pain, swelling, some have fever, headache, um, and just a reminder, you can get the COVID vaccine at the same time as other vaccines. Since uh, we hear a lot that, oh, COVID doesn't affect kids, or it's not really, you know, it's only affecting older adults. But the truth is, since the beginning of the COVID pandemic, among children, there have been 14.9 million cases of COVID reported. Who knows how many have been unreported? Um, and then, unfortunately, COVID has killed 1,513 children. Very sobering numbers. I hate to see that. And then you may have heard of the new bivalent boosters, COVID boosters. Those are now recommended for everyone five and older. The bivalent booster is really important because it not only targets the original COVID strain, but also the Omicron strain. And so it's really important that you go ahead and get your bivalent booster. Um, I did earlier this month, well, I guess it's November. So last month I got that um, along with my flu shot and um, so did my kids and we, was very smooth and easy. Um, we also have been hearing a lot of questions about who needs the bivalent booster, when do you get it, all of that. So it is recommended for everyone um, who has completed their primary COVID doses, and um, it's been at least two months since their last COVID shot, either booster or primary dose. So everyone five and older, as long as it's two months after their last COVID shot. Does anyone have any questions about bivalent boosters? Oh, Marie got that all, got it also. Thank you, it's awesome. Looks like Denise is keeping up with those questions. If there's any questions that you want me to answer, feel free to um, unmute and ask me, Denise. If you need to know where to find a COVID-19 vaccine, TAPI does have a vaccine finder where you can locate a free vaccine near you. Um, it's very simple to use. You type in your address of home or school, um, and it shows all the locations that give the COVID vaccine within a certain amount of miles. So when I was looking for a COVID booster, I put in my address and put within 10 miles and showed me Safeway was the closest. So that's where I went for that. Um, Denise, would you please put the chat, uh, put in the link for the vaccine finder in case anyone would, is interested in that. We do have these flyers available on our website. So if any parents are asking about the COVID vaccine, it might be good to have a few of these on hand. Um, it has our website and also the vaccine finder and how you can, um, if you have any questions about it, the CDC is linked on there if they want to talk about side effects or anything like that. So we do have um, that available on our website. It's really important that you working in a school around a lot of kids and other people that you, um, it's really important that you stay healthy and continue to work with all of those kids and students and families. Um, 
So please try to get your COVID vaccine and also keep up to date on those boosters and make sure that you yourself are protected and you're also protecting those around you. Um, the vaccine is widely available, so you can look at our TAPI vaccine finder or um, contact your county health department for locations. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the immunization data report. Um, and we have Kimberly here, who's gonna answer some questions for us. And if you have any specific questions about the IDR, um, put them in the chat. We got a lot of great questions in the registration form. So thank you so much for sending those ahead of time. And we're gonna go through those and answer them for you. Um, it's really helpful. <laughs> you may hear things that sound familiar because I know, um, as a school nurse or health office person that you may run into these, these questions or situations that you're like, oh, how do I answer that? So um, let's go to the first one. And the first one is a trivia question. So put your answers in the chat. Who needs to complete an IDR? A, licensed child care providers, B, schools, C, preschools, before kindergarten, you know, or D, all of the above? <clears throat> Looks like everyone knows the answer. D, all of the above. That is right. Everyone needs to complete an IDR. Okay, so Kimberly, um, how often do we need to complete the IDR? Hi, everyone. Um, it's once a year, and it comes out usually after Labor Day, right, Blake? And you have till November 15th to complete it. Correct. We always target the Wednesday after Labor Day, so we give you know all the school staff um, a day to come back, and then we like to launch that Wednesday. Yeah, and that, that's why it's so important to start from the beginning when they enroll in your school, um, the ones that are not compliant, the ones that need to have the vaccines, that way you won't be at the last minute, um, you know, trying to get those kids vaccinated. That's true, and you always have the, the students that join later in the year, and you have to make sure that you have all of those records, and I understand it can be quite a process to complete that. Um, so hopefully most of you have are nearing completion on that because it is due pretty soon. Um, I guess real quick, I did want to mention something that came up in the chat and that I want to clarify real quick is um, you can submit this IDR at any time um, starting that Wednesday in September, or you can submit it on November 15th at 1159 p.m. if you really wanted to. Um, obviously, we wouldn't recommend it. It is supposed to be a moment in time snapshot, which means your information is accurate at the time you submit it. If you're worried about a student not, they're going to meet reach a deadline for a vaccine soon or whatnot it is accurate at the time you submit it. That's all you have. That's all you need. Um, do you need to update it in spring? We only do it September to November. Also, um, that does not mean that you don't update vaccines regularly year round. Monitoring vaccines is a constant thing. Um, you know, you should probably do it periodically, at least maybe once a month, just if you, you know, a lot of you have ProCare, um, um, Infinity Campus, et cetera, all these SIS that you could use to run reports. So whether you are in a kindergarten or sixth grade or you're in third grade or in high school, you should be checking those immunizations on a regular basis, no matter whether you report them or not. That's great. Thank you, Blake. Um, and really great to know that it's just a snapshot in, in time, what's happening on, you know, September 30th or, or whatever at your school. So that is very helpful. Um, okay, next question. Is there a family education requirement to accompany the personal exemption form? So that one, the family education requirement, um, I think they're referring to the immunization education course that ADHS has. And uh, all schools and districts are welcome to participate in this. And it's on um, the ADHS website, right, Blake? They can apply for that. 
And that right. way they have to do it. Um, right yeah, so it's it's the program we developed several years ago, probably 2016, 2017. Um, and it is open for people to uh, participate in. Um, it can be a great tool against convenience exempting. Um, it is only an hour, no matter what people tell you. I have done it while I'm working and I've done it in an hour. Um, so it, it's um, available to use and it comes from whoever, um, you know, makes that decision. Yeah, it helps families to, to, um, to be educated on them. Some families don't realize, like we just saw, the importance of vaccines. So when they take this, these, um, what, what, these courses, they realize the importance of it, right? And, it's, and, uh, and it, it educates them and usually the majority go back and get the vaccines when they realize how the importance of it. Yeah, because you know it talks about what the what the vaccines are preventing, and nobody wants their child to possibly get that disease. And so it's a really great education um, opportunity for the parents to hear about, and um, also helps us protect more in our community. So that's great. Yeah, it's really different than just giving them the the piece of paper to sign, right? Those exemptions. Yeah. It gives us an opportunity to educate them and let them know, but it's different when they sit down and see the visuals and stuff. Yeah. It's a good yes. Leticia says, Jamie, I send my students home until they can get their required immunization. That is great. And um, it really depends on the administration in your school and if if that's what they're going to go with. So um, if you have the opportunity, if you don't already require the personal, um, the education um, training before signing that personal exemption form, talk to your administrator about it um, and hopefully get that into um, kind of your, your practice, get into practice doing that. Okay, another trivia question. Um, it says, I can't find a record in ACES for my students. So this means they are not vaccinated. Is this true, false, or are you not sure? Uh, go ahead and put your answer in the chat box. So the question again, I can't find a record in ACES for my student. This means that they are not vaccinated. Is this true or false? I'm so happy to see that everyone knows <laughs> that this is false. Um, just because the record in ACES is not there, it does not mean that they're unvaccinated. So Kimberly, can you tell us, or Blake, if you wanna jump on, can you tell us um, why this, like what, what are some situations where the record would not be an ACEs for the student? Yeah, so um, some of the people have some good uh, mentions in <clears throat> the chat here. Essentially, ACEs is supposed to be this one-stop shop. It's supposed to be this great thing. And honestly, when I've looked at other states, it's actually pretty, does pretty darn well. Um, and I've visited some provider sites. Some of them put them put these records in once a month. I see some provider sites that do it weekly. Even some of them do it daily. They enter them in, they enter in historical, they do not. Um, and for example, uh, my fiance has like three different profiles in ACES and for different flu vaccines because she has two last names, but it, they'll show up as different things. So with a couple of those things is one, it might be show up under someone else. It might not be entered. It also might be because they are out of state. Um, they, you know, various reasons it might not be in there. ACES is not supposed to be the only thing that you use. Um, this is why we have what we put out as the ACER, the Arizona State Immunization Record. However, um, we, you know, we, you could substitute the ACER for, with your SIS if it spits out a report, whether it's per student or tallies. Um, that goes in that student's record um, and can tell you information. So that is that that is what you should use, and that should be a combination of records you have sent from a doctor's office, sent from a person, and then the parent. If let's say you reached out to the doctor's office and they said, "Oh yeah, here, let me send you this record or something, or email it to you real quick," and you put that in their profile, a parent can ask you for that record since yours might be more up to date. It might be an ACES and they don't have it. 
Um, so it's really important to use your SIS or the ACER um, to maintain a, a growing or, you know, always kind of organic uh, paper so it can move along. Yeah, I just, yes. I wanted to put in there as a school nurse that, like I see in the chat, the first thing I would, um, you know, I'd have the, the students' records in front of me and then I would look at ACES. And then I would, you know, put that all in. I, back in the day, I think we had um, Genesis. That was our program for the school. And uh, then I would, you know, from there, figure out what vaccines they needed. So yeah, the, if they're out of state, um, if they if they if they lost their records when they moved, there's a website on Aces, you know the the main the home screen. When you scroll down, there's a there's a website there that you can click on, and it's actually from CDC, and it's got all the like our Aces from, from other states. And what I would do is I would look on, for instance, if it was California, I'd go on California, and I would snip that little screen that had the toll free number and the website. And um, I would give it to the to the parents so they could call and request those those vaccines, just like people request here at county for their Arizona records. They can do that as well, and the parent would do that. And it just depends on the state. Some states wanted the parent to do it. Some states um, just with an email. Just depends on the requirements. But that really really helped for the parents that that uh, had lost their immunizations. And that I would use. And then when that's what we do in the clinics. When you send your students to our clinics, we um, look at the referral form that you send, and we look at ACEs, and we look at we ask them for their records, and then we ask them to you know find the records. And so it's um, that would be one of the reasons, and of course your your um, students that are from out of country, those as well will come will not be in ACEs. Hope that kind of answered. Yeah, it does. I think it does answer the question. Um, Blake, you mentioned a few other forms, um, ACER and SIS. We may have a brand new school nurse on, on the uh, meeting today. So can you kind of talk through the what those different forms are and um, how they would use them? Yeah, I, um, I sent um, a link in the chat and I can go ahead and pull it back up earlier um, okay. for the immunization requirements and forms. Um, that is uh, on the website. I just put that link in there. Um, yes, yeah, so it would be nice to have a national immunization database. That is part of a requirement that, that states build that out. Um, and they're supposed to link up. We just use different providers. So, you know, that's how it goes. But the ACER um, is just a pretty generic form. Um, it's honestly really basic. It doesn't get a whole lot of information, but just, um, I don't know. Do you mind if I share my screen for a little bit, if that's possible, or is that going to mess things up? Awesome. The ACER is like the report, the immunization yes. record. So, okay. So this is what this website looks like right here. Um, for example, this is, so now when you're looking at this, right, this looks like a lot of stuff. What am I looking at? It's nice and easy. These are the useful resources. So this is going to be stuff that guides and other things that we've mentioned. There's Healthy Kids AZ, which we are just, which just received a huge facelift, has a lot of good information on there um, as well. And then we have some basis slides, but then you want to go look at these. Okay, so your school, your school immunization requirements and forms, just to show you a couple of things. Now, here's this, the link to our guide. This is an incredible tool. It's not going to have every situation on there, but this tool will is almost a one size fits all um, for immunization doses, those questions and other things. No, it says four to six years old and attendance in kindergarten or first grade. So for those of you who say, I have a four-year-old who are they, you know, that isn't, vac isn't vaccinated because they're four. Well, these requirements do start at four and they can receive it. If they are within a minimum interval between vaccines, they can be marked as a catch-up, just as a side note. So, so, and then also if you go to the second page here, all these notes are just unique little tools that you can use for scenarios. Like, you know, if final dose was given, or sorry, where's, where's like, if dose one was given more than four days before the first birthday, another dose is required. And that's why you'll see some of those unique scenarios. Um, finally, I will also go to right here is they could order the ACER right through this link. Um, but this is what it looks like here. Um, it is, again, it's, it's really basic. It doesn't hold a lot of information. It's not easily transferable into an Excel sheet. It is supposed to be in 
easy thing that schools can use to make the basis. Um, your SIS usually don't, and we don't, we don't sponsor any SIS in particular. We don't work with them. They look at our requirements, and they build their systems off of it. I could look at those reports and tell you what they mean, um, but I have nothing to do with those. So, but they, these, this is what it looks like you have right here. Um, now and it's nicely um, organized. So it has these for, these are these ones for um, childcare right here and as well as the McCockle and a few others. Um, but we all, and this doesn't mean that they're required. Notice that this says recommended vaccines. I will note Hep A is recommend is required and Hib is required. Uh, Hep A is required in Maricopa County. Hib is required statewide um, for child care facilities, but it is not required um, for grade school. So, anyways, you can mark the doses, and this is supposed to be okay. Dose one, date, boom. You put dose one here, and then dose two there, and th the dates are important because that shows you where you can. Um, you know, how you base those minimum intervals and when they need another dose. Um, so it's really important to have those in there, especially if you go through and are wondering why these kids are here or the doctor's saying that they aren't ready yet. Well, then you could look back and you could see that there. Um, do you have anything else you need me to share, Laura, while I have my screen up? Um, so we got a few questions. Why is there two places for a signature? Yeah, let me see. So where we have a signature here. And do you guys see the second one? Like I'm um, is he talking about the reviewed by here. May, yeah, I'm not sure. Joyce, if you want to chat in exactly what yeah, you're referring to. to right now. I guess I um, I'll let you know. And then Lauren is asking any thoughts on making this a fillable PDF form? Well, that would be fantastic. Um, why do I feel like we have a fillable PDF form of this? You know Maybe. what? That's a great question. I thought it used to be a fillable PDF form and we update these every year. Um, so there might be, there might have been, a, it might it used to be fillable, but now it, it appears it's not. So I will okay. have to look at this. Hey, hey, Blake, is that yes. the one that, the, is that the referral from on the top? Can you go back on top? That? Yes. Okay. So this is the Acer. Yeah. And I'll show you guys okay. actually that that's, oh, sorry. Why did I stop sharing my screen? I I was just saying that referral form when it has recommended and required, mm -hmm. it really helps us in the clinics when when you guys put in the recommended right and the required because we're going to give them all the required vaccines, which is Hep A, HPV, and all that. Yes, you can put those in as well. That way, the parents don't come and say to us, "Well, they only said two, Tdap and meningococcal." Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but you recommend you know this HPV against cancer. Mm. That's the one. Thank you, Blake. Yeah. It really helps when you when you send this in to us to also circle the recommended. Let's see how the flu is down here. And we mm. would really that really helps us to vaccinate our community because you guys, that means you guys are on board with us as well, right? We're all one and it's not just uh, public health. Um yeah, yeah. And I think it is it, the important thing is using what, what they call presumptive language. Uh that's because it's basically telling them this is what you are going to get rather than saying, well, what vaccines do you want to get? Because um, a lot of us don't know and, and they do rely on us and people trust you as the nurse and as the health professional to dictate information or tell them, you know, what they need and say and provide that, you know, rather than saying, ah, well, you know, they could use another HEP, hep A dose, but they need uh, one varicella and you, that's it but say well no you're going to get this 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 that's what you need um, that's some, some good important kind of stuff to to do so Blake can you go back to the Acer form for just a minute mm -hmm. sorry this so the way. nurse or health office staff are they supposed to sign the top school use only signature or the bottom reviewed by or both so this school, this signature is required of providing copy to parents. So what that is saying is that you are signing this on that date and it is as as accurate as of that date. That okay. is where it's supposed to be. This is the reviewed by because generally you would be the only person reviewing the records. Um, you would put your name in there. Okay, so that's a yes on both both spots, right? The nurse signs both spots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you would only you only sign this when you give it to a parent. Okay, and then when they bring it back, then you re 
do the review. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, again, I you probably would print a copy of it and you probably would have this and you'd print a copy, sign it and, and hand it to the parent. And then they would bring it back and you just update or scan the copy in or okay. update what you have. Um, again, this is the Acer. It is, you know, you are well within your right to use an SIS as long as it covers all of these bases there. Okay, perfect. Yeah, and I, question in the chat says that we're not, we were told we cannot use ACES for people not needing doses for school requirements. Um, I, I understand that that can be a tricky subject. Um, school requirements are dictated by law. So if, if, for example, if it's like um, a, a HPV or something like that, that, that probably is, is a tricky area. Um, but if you, as the parent, as you know, your school health staff, you could use ACEs to look up vaccines. And if you are trying to say, hey, you know, this is what is, is available, you can um, find it. Well, yeah, it says right there, CDC recommended. I mean, you're gonna recommend the vaccine. You're not mm -hmm. trying to get it per se, but you're recommending it. That way the parent is more open to us to hear us about the recommend, the, what we recommend. Whereas they come in and they'll say, nope, the school nurse didn't say they needed that one. That's the, that's the tricky part, recommended and required. Um, that is great. Thank you so much. And many people are putting in the chat that the, um, there is a fillable PDF form online at ACES or in your health record program that yes. you use at your school. I so, just downloaded it and it is fillable. <laughs> Maybe it was oh, just cool. fillable when I used it there, but when I opened it up in the desktop app, it's fillable. So, okay, perfect. Um, I'm trying to scroll through and see if there is anything we didn't answer already. Um, would a student who is newly enrolled in preschool and missing shots, would they be would they be considered conditional enrollment while I give them two weeks to get vaccinated? Correct. Yes. Yeah, so okay. a great a grace period. Um, it, it's two weeks. Uh, it's officially. It could be. Uh, it could be more than that. Um, so this is like the official rule and how it works. Let's say day one, you you see that they're behind on vaccines. You notify the parent they have five business or school days um, to get to get that vaccine uh, or sorry to request it you would have to reach out to someone to request it from their previous parents so they have five days to give you the record then you have then you let, tell them that they are delinquent on a vaccine which means you ha now have another five business days to get that up to date and then they would have a five additional days to get that up-to-date record into you so that's where that two weeks comes in is because it's, you have notified them that you, you have the record and you, they have notified them. So then that starts the five days of notification. And then they have five days after the supposed, when they get it to get um, that record into you. So that's where you get the two weeks from. Okay, perfect. Um, keep putting your questions in the chat and we will try mm -hmm. to answer as many as possible. And, yeah. Sorry, one, one last thing, I, I apologize. Um, the, that I forgot to mention is if you are behind on a vaccine and you are not within the minimum interval, which is usually four weeks for Hep A, it's six months. Uh, for the last dose of DTAP, I think is six months. If you're within that um, period, then you are, um, you know, you are L, you are considered a conditional admission slash catch up because you physically cannot get vaccinated until you um, for that time being. And then is there a place where this, the rule is written, the two week grace period? Is it on the form I, or? I would have to go find it. Um, okay. I could, I could try and work on that. I think it's in the Arizona Musician Handbook. Okay. It is in the handbook. I know it's there. I was, I am not exactly sure how it, it's, I think it's somewhere um, in the Arizona Administrative Code. And that's one thing to note is the Arizona Revised Statutes is the law that is there. And then the Arizona Administrative Code is describes how that law is um, enforced or how it works in practice. So that is where you'll see a date that says November 30th, the immunization records due. But the Arizona Administrative, as the last date that we could absolutely require it by, when then Arizona Administrative Code is where 
um, we get in. And the grace period is for everybody. It is not just for, it is not just for preschool. It is for everyone. Um, and yes, Arizona Administrative Code has it in there somewhere. I would have to I have a big manual that I have of, of these things. And I can't remember the exact thing it is. But again, an Arizona Administrative Code is how the law works. And it is a legal um, requirement. And this is as a school child care operating the state, you're supposed to follow these. Um, thank you, Marie, for putting that quick launch code to generate the ACR, ACER um, HLT212. That is awesome. Um, let's see. You all are being so helpful on answering questions in the chat. So thank you so much. That is great. Um, Yovana has a suggestion on the ACER form. Can you please put the date the next vaccine is due? That's a great, that's great feedback. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Ivana actually just emailed you recently. That's um, so one thing that like during this meeting, <laughs> can a student register with non-compliant immunizations? Um, they should not be. Well, okay, yes, they can. Um, they just would need to have you know identified that yes, this is when that that's where you get into the idea of you have five days from enrollment into um, to get to to identify it. Or to submit the record, then they have five. This was five days to say you need to be up to date, and then that's five days to get that. So that's where that whole fourteen technical days, where it comes on the fifteenth day, you're you're late. So again, you enroll, you submit your record, you they have the school has five days to tell. Or sorry, you enroll, they tell you you're up to date. They have five days to schedule, five days to get it. Yes, sorry. Okay, so you have from enrollment. Five days to give them your rec give them a record of the vaccines as a parent or of the kids' record. Then once that record is received, that they would say, "Hey, you're not up to date." So you have an additional five days to have the appointment, and then you, for after that appointment, you have five days to get that record in. So yes, you can. Um, obviously, we would not recommend. We would recommend that they get those done um, before enrollment. Uh, a lot of schools and things that I have seen that um, are beneficial are putting in their sign up, uh, sign up documents, putting the consent forms into the doc, into their enrollment documents and putting those in there. Um, being, and that also helps with starting as early as you can. I mean, when it comes to the IDR, I know that's a big deal, but you know, if you start that on the first week of school and by the time the IDR rolls around, you would have them up to date. Yeah, um, uh, answering uh, Ivana's about the clinic nurses, we do tell them when they're supposed to come back, when the next one is due, and we give them a little note as well. But I'll remind the nurses um, and see if they're still doing that. But when I'm at the clinic, that's what I do. And I see other nurses as well. But um, thanks for uh, reminding us about that. And we do do that. And we explain to them when the next one is due. Okay, well, let's go to the next one and keep putting your questions in the chat. We will definitely... Um, try to answer them. This kind of goes along with that trivia question. I have many students who have their immunization records from out of state or out of the USA. Some pediatricians do not want to enter these into ACES. So what is your recommended response to this? Um, does Do many of you face that? Do you see that they don't have any records? Like, I'd love to hear more about that. But Kimberly, what do you, what do you say about um, how they should get those into ACES? Well, when you send them to the clinic, we do look at the historicals and we do put them in as historicals at the clinics here at County, that's what we do. Um, but when I was uh, back in the 2000s, early 2000s, I was a school nurse. Um, what I would do is I had a friend, I had a connection to ADHS and I would fax those records to her and she'd put them in, but this is the early 2000s. At ACES, so I don't think ACES, I don't think they have that service anymore. I'm not sure if they do, if ACES can do that for you, because they can only be put in as, as historicals. And then the same at the same token is um, a person needs to to interpret those records the right way, especially when they're out of the U.S. There are different uh, names of vaccines. So at the clinics, uh, we've been trained to to recognize those different names. From different from foreign countries, 
And uh, then we work with the parents and we also have documents you can look up. So that's very important that the person that puts them as historicals needs to know what historicals they are. Um, I, and there's also, there's also on the ACES homepage, when you scroll down the bottom there, there's also a um, vaccine names on there as well, like, you know, abbreviations and stuff that sometimes you'll, you'll find that you don't understand. They have like a, a chart there that helps you to see what vaccines they are. And then you can always, you can always uh, call our clinics and we'll help you as well. I've gotten, I've had calls when I'm at the clinics and here as well at the office, some school nurses asking me to help them um, decipher that. Yeah. I hope that so, helps. What do you think, Blake? Um, I did see, so Sandra just put in the chat that they, that some people at ACES do that. Um, I reached out to some of my colleagues today I'm not aware of this, and since I have been um, here for um, just over two years now, we had a lady, some of you might have known, Brenda Jones, um, who worked here for a very long time. Um, she stressed that, you know, it wasn't something that that we did or that was widespread, and, it's, and my colleague said it's not something that they necessarily do, that, that some people can do it, um, but it's not a practice because it um, and it has to be verifiable records, very verifiable records, because and so with that, however, and I know you guys mentioned providers don't want to enter in historicals, it, you have to have right access to enter in historical information, which is why the counties are able to do it because they are providers of vaccines, they are the county health department. Um, so it is just important to um, I, again, providers, a lot of them can or cannot, and we would love for them to do it. Um, this is why, this underscores why it is so important that you guys as update the, these ACE, the ACER or update their SIS and print out that form and put it in their permanent record um, with the school. So that way those, those records are considered the most up-to-date. So ACES, again, while it is super convenient and useful and can help with a lot of things, it is not supposed to be the be all end all. And that is why it's important to maintain a record. And again, why I, I do think SISs are very valuable in that regard, um, but make sure that, that they cover all the bases and that you, know, you are putting in all the information accurately so that not just so that you could read it, but so a parent could read it, provider could read it, another school can read it. That's great. So if you're running into that, <clears throat> definitely reach out to your county health department first and see if they are able to help you update those records in ACES. Yeah, we can and help. then if you're still having issues, contact us at TAPI and we'll figure out where to go from there. Uh, the next question, where should we report total vaccination rates or numbers for all grades and ages in smaller schools? So what I, yeah, what I understand this is that um, they're not collected, but the requirements still stand and we should track and maintain these. Is that correct, Blake? That is correct. Okay. And then um, just like an entering, there's probably been different entering errors. So how do we enter or update immunizations when the fourth DTAP dose was given before four years of age? Is that compliant or not? So what, what um, they need the fourth dose at four years old enough. And that happens a lot with the foreign records sometimes is that that fourth dose was given before they were four years old. So it needs to be, they need to have the fourth dose four years and up. So that would make them not compliant. It was given before four years of age. Yeah, they're not compliant. But, um, and so they would need the fifth dose. So just to remember that it's not so much the numbers, it's the spacing and stuff too that we need to look at as well, right? So how would, um, we have to make sure that they're up to date with immunization. So it has to be four years old and up. Right? So yes, they would need that fifth dose if mm -hmm. they got it before age four. Right. And if sometimes we'll see that if they're seven years old, so we won't give the DTAP, we'll give the TDAP. Perfect. The important things that get their tetanus, right? And their diphtheria. Yes. 
So what do you mean when you're stating that they, it's also important to look at the spacing? Yeah, the, well, this one definitely has to be four years up and up. But a lot of the, the most of the musations are the spacing between them because that creates the immunity in the system. If we give it too soon. You have to be really careful about that. Yeah, on that um, school, on that, again, the webpage where you have all the requirements of forms, the re uh, requirements guide, it shows you each dose and the minimum interval that's supposed to happen between those. And it's also important not to wait for that minimum interval. You don't want to be at four weeks and realize, oh, man, they need it because now they're non-compliant and it's not their fault that they're non-compliant. Um, you know, when when you they're if they're behind, they need two doses. They get one. Four weeks go by, and you haven't told them they need another dose. You know, make sure make sure they do that. Um, yeah. yeah. So that one on. So here's the what what the official word is is DTAP. Uh, sorry, Tdap given at age seven to nine years of age does not count for the eleven year old Tdap requirement. Tdap should be given once five years has passed since last dose of tetanus diphtheria containing vaccine was given. Retrospectively, if a child received a Tdap at age 10 as part of a catch-up series or inadvertently earlier than the recommended age, the dose may be counted as the adolescent dose and is acceptable to meet school requirements. Um, in general, a child should not receive more than four doses prior to the fourth birthday or a total of six doses prior to the seventh birthday. However, the child should still receive a dose at slash after four years of age and at least six months from the previous dose. So that is what's officially in our word. I hope that answers some of these questions. I'm not a nurse. I, you know, got my public health degree. I know I took the MCAT, did all that, but I'm not a nurse. So okay, let me go over some resources that we have for you, and then if there's more questions, put them in the chat, and we'll see if we can answer them at the end. Um, it's really important that you know where you can find reliable resources, know what apps, websites, books, videos are from trusted sources. Um, this handout is going to be available on our website and it lists many of those resources for you. Um, if you want like videos or more specific things, uh, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia is really great when talking about vaccine education. There's a lot of videos that you can use to show to parents. Um, they have like common questions that they hear a lot and then how to answer those. Um, and it can be a really great educational tool. Also, we do recommend that you go to the CDC for um, vaccine related information and um, the website is there. And of course, refer to your doc, to the, um, the student's doctor for any um, other questions. We Tappy does have a school nurse webpage, which can be very helpful for what you all are doing. Um, on the webpage, we have a lot of different resources, um, things you can download and print, common questions that you may hear about COVID vaccines or regular vaccines, um, links to ACES and IDRs, lots of communication for parents. Um, we do have some Spanish resources on there. If you need an immunization schedule, you can download that. Um, Denise, could you put that in the chat if you haven't already? It's a really great resource to have if you have a question about vaccines, you know exactly where to go. Um, I will be emailing you a link to this page if you want to refer to it later on. Um, so watch for that too after the training is done. This, uh, this vaccine conversations and parents handout, it was developed, developed by our coalition members. And it's really just kind of like a cheat sheet talking points of how to answer tough questions. So we have this av available for you. Um, it just kind of gives you some talking points and makes it really easy to answer common questions that you may hear. Also, our website is listed here, whyimmunize.org, where we have multiple different resources and um, things all about vaccines. These are some of our free resources. Um, we have flyers and handouts and brochures and stickers, buttons, postcards, all kinds of different things. So depending on what would be helpful for you at your school, um, sometimes people really like to use this uh, poster in their health office um, just to remind people how to 
um, cover your cough. It's flu season. We don't want people to be spreading around flu or RSV or anything like that. So there are lots of different resources available for you. Sometimes people find some of these would be helpful to print out and give uh, send home with students. Um, all of these are available for downloading or if you want us to print them and ship them to you, we are happy to do that. All of these things are for free. Um, and then I always like to talk about vaccines for children. If their health insurance does not cover vaccines or if they don't have health insurance, you can still get children immunized against preventable diseases uh, with no fee. So it's a federally funded program called Vaccines for Children and your county health department knows where you can go to get those. So not having insurance should never be a reason, um, a barrier to prevent you from getting immunized. So this is a great resource to give to parents. And thank you so much to our presenters. Um, here at TAPI, we love to give prizes. We do have an evaluation. If you wanna fill it out, you can be entered into the drawing. Uh, five prizes will be given. So please take a minute and kind of tell us, give us some feedback about our training and let us know what was helpful or what we can do to improve next time um, because your feedback really helps us in the future. Um, my contact information is on this slide, so if you have any questions or if you think of something later, please email me. I would be happy to um, answer it or direct you to the right person who knows um, the answer. And then if you are a registered nurse or social worker or health education specialist, you can receive CEUs for today's training. We will email you that survey link. Um, I had someone contact me that is an EMT and we can offer certificates for that. So let us know if you have any questions. And that's the end of our training. We have a few minutes to get to any other questions in the chat. Um, if Denise emailed you that you were a winner, please respond to that because we wanna make sure that you get a prize for answering our trivia questions. Um, I'm just going to scroll up and see if we have any other questions that were not answered already. And Laura, I wanted to thank Tappy for inviting um, us on here. Um, any questions, you guys just call the county. We'll help you, call our, call, um, call our clinics. We'll help you. I get, I get several calls when I'm out there from schools that help me, you know, help me, I can't understand this or what do I need to do? And uh, we'll help you. You can email us and stuff. So we're here for you. Just let us know. Give us a call. Yeah. And, you know, we really love to hear from our schools. We support you and know how hard um, things can get. And if you get a lot of questions from a lot of different parents, it's um, it's hard to answer them. And we want to be supportive to you. Um, so this recording will be available on our school nurse website, along with the slides and the handouts and everything we talked about today. So I will be emailing you that. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, if there's someone in the room watching with you, like maybe two nurses or health office um, are together, make sure to put their name in the chat just so we can give them credit for attending today and um, make sure our numbers are, are correct for um, reporting purposes. So glad this was helpful. Thank you for all the kind messages in the chat. Um, and really appreciative of all your help. Thanks, Blake, for sharing your screen and kind of walking us through what that looks like. That is very helpful. Yeah, thank you everyone. Hey. Um, I appreciate it. And do feel free to reach out and ask me questions about the IVR reporting requirements. Um, if I don't know the dose requirement information, I can find someone who does. So thank you. And Denise, can you put that um, evaluation link one more time in the chat in case anyone missed it?
There we go. Okay, there's the evaluation in the chat. Feel free to take it and hopefully you will win a prize. We love to give out prizes to all of our participants. Okay, thank you so much and everyone have a great day.